Hello, what you're about to see is a small piece of a larger interview that was done with Elizabeth and me so that we can uh, help people get to know us. And we also invite you to send us a note so we can get to know you better. We've met many of you through Zoom meetings, etc., and we'll continue to do that, but perhaps this is helpful too. You can find it also on the McFarland app. We hope you'll see it there and share it with others. Thank you and enjoy. What excites you about being back in the local church? Ah. Both of you, for, I'd love to hear both of your responses to that. You know, the local church is really where uh, the real work happens. If you're going to change lives and change the world by the activity and the work, the prayers, the engagement of those changed, live, uh, changed lives, then it happens, um, it, the locus of it is the, is the local church. And so for seven years, I was working as what we call the key missional strategist for the district to try to help churches um, set outcomes and establish strategies so that we could transform the world. Being in the district was, um, was very different because it's, it was very much his job and I was over here with my own thing. So being back in the church, you know, allows me to once again be more a part of people's lives um, rather than pop in and pop out. Um, one of the things when we would visit churches is in announcements and they would talk about something that was coming up and I would think, oh, that sounds good. Oh, this isn't my church. <laughs> so, um, you know, just to be able to be more involved. If there's one thing I would say, you know, just to bring us up to today, um, it's just a rich, deep blessing to connect with the people of this church and the history and heritage of this church and to make that connection for the future of this church. And we've come at this time of pandemic and social distancing. Um, it's just the weirdest experience to stand at the pulpit and preach the whole congregation and have one person in the sound booth. But then to meet people through Zoom sessions and meet people who come through here occasionally and be out at the food pantry and um, meet the staff and work with the staff, um, still God is actively at work um, pulling us together and blending our lives together and creating ministry and the future of our ministry together, even in these times. So we're blessed and happy and glad to be here. Um, God is pouring energy into this new venture.
Welcome to McFarland Memorial United Methodist Church. My name is Wendy Neal and I'm the associate pastor here and I am so glad that you are worshiping with us today. Go online and let us know that you're here by registering, registering your attendance and also you can lift up any prayer requests that you have. I'm also excited to share that today we are adding a second in-person worship opportunity. If you are loving being at home and are not ready to get out, that is totally okay. But if you are ready for an in-person worship experience, we have a service at 8.30 in the morning and at 11.15 right here in Finn Hall. Go online, RSVP, let us know that you're coming and I promise that you will be blessed. As we begin our time of worship today, we want to invite God's Spirit to come into our lives to fill us and to speak to us. And so let's pray. Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for this day and for this opportunity to give you our thanks and our praise to say, I love you. God, as we continue to deepen our walk with you, we just ask that you would remind us in big ways and small ways that you are always with us, leading us, guiding us, speaking to us, God, calling us to be your people. And we are so grateful for that. And so be with us during this time of worship, God, and speak to our hearts once again. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You 
came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status is nothing. The King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take. The one that
Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you and we admit that we don't have things all figured out, even though we may think we do sometimes. We know that you're the one who truly has everything figured out, God. We put our complete trust and faith in you and only you, God. We ask that you help us to be less selfish, to think more of others, and most importantly, God, to think of you first. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus, in everything that we do and say every day of our lives. We love you so very much, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, my name is Austin Levierfon, and I'm the director of McFarland's Middle School and College Ministries. And it is just such a blessing to be in worship with you all this morning, even as we do it um, at a distance. And we've gotten pretty used to that, haven't we? But one thing that has not changed in the midst of our worship is our time of offering. And this is when we come together and we offer up our gifts to the Lord, our financial gifts to the Lord. And one thing we remember during this time is that these financial gifts are not meant to be spent and used by the discretion of our staff, but through prayerful discretion of what the Spirit is leading us as a congregation to do, not only within the walls of McFarland, but beyond these walls in the greater kingdom of God. So as we offer those gifts, which there's many ways to do that, you can do that through our PushPay app. You can go there and it's very simple, pretty self-explanatory, or you can go to mcfarlandumc.org slash give. So as we give those gifts, I would invite you into this time of prayer to be in prayer with me over these gifts and how God will be um, using them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just give thanks for the gifts of those who give today, God. And no matter the amount, God, uh, it doesn't really matter to you what the amount is, but God, you care more about the matter of our heart and the spirit of our giving. So God, take these gifts, whatever they may be, and then supplement them, God. Use them in ways that our hands could never use them. God, take them and extend them further than the dollar amount. God, use them to build your kingdom beyond these walls of McFarland. God, use them to reach out to the broken souls of those who just need to know that they are cared for and loved, that need to know that there is a God who would send their, the, his son to die for their transgressions. God, we just give thanks. Even in the midst of this offering, God, we remember that everything that we have is truly yours. So God, as we give this offering, we're really just returning back a portion of what you've already given us just as an act of praise and worship and thanksgiving. And God, we believe in the Spirit's power to move through this offering and to extend your kingdom. And God, in that we rejoice and give thanks. It's in your Son's name that we pray all these things. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God of light and love, give us today a spirit of wisdom and insight Enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may perceive how the Spirit may use the meditations and thoughts of our hearts together with the words of my mouth to speak to us today. We come listening for the nurture of our own lives and for the advance of the mission of Jesus. Amen. A man bought a donkey from a preacher the preacher told the man that the donkey had specific commands. He would only go if you say hallelujah, and he'll only stop if you say amen. Well, the man was pleased and wanted to try this out. So he got on the donkey and he shouted hallelujah, and the donkey started moving, and he shouted amen, and the donkey stopped. He was so pleased he bought the donkey on the spot. And then he trotted off with the donkey on his trail up into the mountains, a long journey, and finally he was trotting along on this little donkey, and he noticed he was headed toward a cliff, and the donkey started trotting a little faster. 
And the man said, stop, halt. Oh, what is that word? He couldn't remember. A uh, church, a uh, Bible, a uh, prayer. Oh, he couldn't remember, and so he began to pray, Dear God, please stop this donkey. Amen. And the donkey stopped right on the edge of the cliff. And the man leaned back and shouted with a loud voice, Hallelujah! Well, hallelujah simply means praise God. And expressing praise to God robustly and loudly can have a real impact upon us. Hopefully not like the impact on that now flying donkey and the man shouting amen all the way down. In today's gospel text about the healing of the ten lepers, we find Jesus engaged in a story of generous praise and a surprising hallelujah. The ten with leprosy are trapped, they're captive to faith, they're hemmed in by a wall of pain and fear. In that ancient culture, they are shunned from society. They are the dire pariahs of their day with no medicine and no cure. They're desperate for liberation, for escape from their plight. Jesus simply tells them to heed the religious law and go show themselves to the priests so they can get permission to go back into society, and immediately, suddenly, they are all healed. Nine find escape, and one finds liberation. Nine disappear again into obscurity, famous for what they do not do, and the face of this one reappears over the centuries, smiling and tearful, in the face of millions of people who have read this scene and applauded this man along with Jesus because of his praise-filled return to give praise to God. The difference is emphasized in the way that Luke tells the story. He saves the surprise announcement that this man is a Samaritan, a foreigner, too late in the story. This disdained Samaritan would have been one of the most doubtful people to come back to the Jewish Jesus, this rabbi, and give him thanks and praise. He's the despised neighbor among the despicable lepers. The essential difference, though, is that the miracle of his cure is accompanied by a miracle of insight. This man, when he sees that he has been raised, healed, when he realizes that he's the recipient of grace, the gift of life, he is radically empowered to turn around, turn to God, shouting or singing praises to God with a loud voice, hallelujahs, and to return to Jesus with this word of thanks, thanks to God for God's work through Jesus in healing him, setting him free. This man could have easily run off with the other nine, just as eager as they were to go to the priest and then go home and embrace their family, and hug their friends, and eat with them. A normal life. He could have escaped history into the oblivion of living only for himself, but he came back hailing the gift of life in praise to God and thanks to God. I believe we are led to believe that he would never take life for granted again. He was empowered to act distinctively different than his now absentee and thankless partners in misery and mercy. He was empowered and liberated because he made the connection between the rescue and God's desire to set him free. Jubilation erupts in his heart, and he knows it's right to give his thanks and his praise. In fact, the way Luke tells the story, even intensifies the man's praise of God. It portrays the man as praising God with a lot of emotional generosity. Unlike the others, he makes this rapid U-turn when surely he's also, as I said, eager to go home. He comes back toward Jesus praising God with a loud voice, with volume, with intensity, with amplified demonstration. He falls 
on his face, stretched out on the ground before Jesus in a posture of worship and honor. And the words of Jesus also intensify his hallelujahs because Jesus intentionally then points out that he's different than the nine. And where are they? And that he, from the lips of Jesus, is the lone foreigner who has come back to praise God. Jesus ends the scene by commending the faith of this man, the faith that he sees in this healed man. Get up, go on your way, go live your life. Your faith has made you well. The word translated made you well is the verb for saving or salvation. It can mean made you whole, not just healed, like the other nine were also healed, but saved, transformed, liberated into a new experience of going on his way. Jesus is emotionally generous by saying, your faith has saved you. We know that it is, it is the grace of God that heals the man, of course. We know that it is the grace of God that saves and liberates the lost and the oppressed. We know that Jesus acted in faithfulness to God, channeling God's healing grace to these ten men. But Jesus says, your faith, not my effort, your faith not saying God's grace, has made you not only well, but whole. To this man, he declares your trust in the goodness of God, your trust in daring to ask, your trust expressed as generous praise has made you whole. Now, there are three other healing stories in the Gospel of Luke that also end with this statement, your faith has made you whole. In each case, Jesus refocuses the action and the source of the liberation and the healing on the faith of the person. In this way, Jesus is generous, commending and praising the faith or the trust of the person in each case. One of these is in chapter 7. And there Jesus is invited to a dinner party given by one of the prominent religious leaders. And there's a woman who's known to the villagers as a sinner who comes to the dinner and makes a real display of honor and respect for Jesus. As was the custom of treating a dinner guest, she washes his feet, but with her tears, using her hair as a towel. She pours ointment on his feet, and the custom was to pour oil, anoint the head of the person with oil. And she kisses him with the customary kiss of greeting in that culture. Now the religious leader, he's put off by her display and complains that if Jesus were a true prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner, and he would rebuke her. He would step away from her. Jesus uses the moment to draw a contrast and to teach this religious leader to teach him a lesson. Jesus points out that this Pharisee failed to give on three counts. He failed to give him water to wash his feet, he failed to greet him with a kiss, and he failed to anoint him with oil. But the woman did all three of these. She displays thanks and praise. She expresses faith and trust in Jesus. She, she is in the moment attending to and expressing her praise. So Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. Jesus says to her, your faith has made you whole. Like the healed leper, her generous display of honor and homage of praise is a new beginning for this woman. To move from her life, from whatever kind of selfish indulgence there may have been, to a life of liberated generosity. The woman is extravagant in her actions of praise, similar to the conduct of the healed leper. She gives in triplicate. 
including what must have been to her costly ointment. Her faith is revealed by these acts of generosity, of generous and emotionally generous praise, honor, respect, and appreciation using her own tears and her own provisions. For this woman, like for the healed leper, Jesus also is generous by commending her faith rather than God's forgiving grace and rather than his part in her liberation and transformation It's not that Jesus, of course, denies God's work of generous love through him, but that he desires to be generous to this woman, with this woman, for this woman, this woman who has struggled with whatever her actions have been and with being stigmatized as sinner. So for both the healed man and the forgiven woman, Jesus graciously names and celebrates what he sees in them by their emotional generosity toward God and God's work in Jesus. He names and celebrates their faith. He names and calls out what is best in them. The robust and generous praise of God by the healed man is the beginning of a new opportunity for him an opportunity for the man to become what the scriptures call a cheerful giver, a happy giver, someone who is just happily generous. We can think of such an attitude and feeling as being emotionally generous. I've already pointed out that both the healed man and Jesus act in ways that are emotionally generous, by their expressions of praise and expressions of commendation. So here's what I believe. Here's what I believe in connection with our current six-week emphasis called The Walk, and this week focusing on giving, on financial stewardship, on being generous. I believe that cheerful generosity cheerful generosity of all kinds with an attitude and a mindset of wanting to do, find in others what is best and do what is best, I believe that cheerful generosity and the practice of genuine praise, praise of God and by extension God's work in and through the church, I believe that is the beginning of real generosity. Genuine and generous praise of God and God's mission generates a holy and happy generosity. When any of us realize true appreciation for the ministry and the mission of God, for God's provisions in our own lives of love and comfort and wisdom and peace and strength, we are inspired to give. We are inspired to give generously. We are spurred toward generosity. Giving begins, the practice of giving, the lifestyle of giving begins with emotional generosity expressed in praise and thanks to God for God's ongoing work. Of course, for some people, this emotional generosity is a challenge. The challenge is the presence and practice of what has been called emotional stinginess. This challenges our walking with God. This challenges our discipleship. But both the challenge and the opportunity is for all of us to turn around like the, like the healed leper turned around and move away from emotional stinginess toward emotional generosity. To move away from emotional stinginess, it begins with our praise of God. To move away from our tentative and broken hallelujahs toward a robust praise of God genuinely from the depths of our hearts is the opportunity. Yes, we may be challenged, And on this continuum between emotional generosity and emotional stinginess, we find ourselves at various places. Some people are dominated by one and some are dominated by the other. Emotional generosity is the act of making others feel 
positive without expecting anything in return. Celestine Shua, in an article on, posted on personal, the site Personal Excellence, talks about these two aspects of our praise and generosity. She says that emotionally stingy people have a miserly attitude toward sharing and giving. They are reluctant to praise others, often sizing them up before expressing approval. They are judgmental and critical of how others act. She says emotionally stingy people are that way because of some factors, and name seven of those. One is that such people lack happiness in their own life, which is why they have few positive emotions to share with others. Most of the time they're too trapped in their own mental cages to think about the well-being and the good of others, to see the faith in others. Also, they may be miserable on the inside and they want others to share their misery. Misery loves company. Or they're simply selfish. They don't want others to experience what they have gained for themselves. The few things they have or the many things they have, they've worked hard to get them, and so they don't think it's fair to be generous with others. Or maybe people are emotionally stingy because they have an unhealthy ego to them, praising someone means acknowledging that that person may be superior to me. This means admitting that I myself may not be as good as they are. Or they're competitive. They see people as competition and they don't want to share what they have. Or they're fearful and afraid that they'll be hurt if they, if they share kindness and generosity and goods and provisions but get nothing in return. And finally, they operate on a zero-sum mentality. They have this belief that whatever is gained by one is lost to the other. They believe, to, believe if they share what they have, then they'll have less for themselves. But friends, there is certainly good news. We see it in the stories of the Scripture today. Things can turn around. People can turn around. Even if any of us find ourselves dominated by emotional stinginess all the time or sometimes from any of these seven factors, like the leper who is healed and the woman who is forgiven and commended, we can be liberated from this emotional stinginess. We can find the joy of emotional generosity. Our journey into greater generosity towards others and towards God and God's mission begins with intentional engagement in praise and thanksgiving. A few weeks ago, Pastor Wendy preached about worship and prayer and the importance of that in our walk. And this brings us back to that in some ways. You know, during this time of worship and church participation, participation at a distance and in at least some level of isolation, it can be tempting to be more passive in our praise and worship. We can be shy about singing aloud when we're alone or with a few family members in front of a screen in our homes. But let me encourage all of us to engage with extra effort to stretch ourselves, to engage in praise and thanksgiving of God as a way of increasing our emotional generosity. Try worshiping with a loud voice. Prepare for worship ahead of time. Show up for worship when you plan to engage online or when you come in person. Limit the distractions. Genuine, robust, regular praise of God is the beginning, the generating engine of being truly generous people. We can do it in our own ways, but let's do it with gusto. Let me also encourage all of us to practice praise and appreciation of others for, ex for what they do, for who they are, not expecting return but to call out the best in those people. Yeah. Our family members, our friends, our co-workers, our team members, even strangers, cashiers, 
online phone conversations, and on and on. Practice beginning each in interpersonal encounter or conversation by assuming the best of people and assuming their intentions and their motivations are good. Focus on praising people and highlighting something good about them or something good about what they have to say as the first thing that we do. If we notice things we don't like or we feel ourselves becoming critical or see something that we think is a fault, let's just sidestep that thought for a moment and look for what we can commend in the person, what is good and true and beautiful. I would also encourage intentional praise and appreciation with thanksgiving to God for the robust and effective ministries of our church, for all the lay leadership of our church committees and boards and ministries, for lay ministers engaged in music ministry, teaching Sunday school classes, small groups, leading helping ministries, for the faithful workers and leaders in our child care, for staff members stretching themselves and giving of themselves, relearning and doing ministry in different and new and added ways during this pandemic. Such praise and appreciation is the beginning and the basis of strong, generous financial support for God's mission through the church. And I do join with others, many others, in offering sincere praise and appreciation with thanksgiving to God for you, you church. You are showing your faith and your faithfulness week by week by your faithful engagement in prayers, in ministry, in financial support for your church and the ministries of the church. Praise be to God that we have so many emotionally generous people who are also generous with your time, your talent, and your treasures. Your generosity generates the advance of God's mission. Finally, as a part of engaging in the walk emphasis during these six weeks, here is the growth challenge. Here is a practice and a means for us to become more adept at praise and more emotionally generous. The challenge is this. Intentionally prepare and plan to do five acts, five acts of extraordinary generosity over the next month. One a week plus one. Five acts of extraordinary generosity over the next month. And let it become then a part of our lifestyle. Lavish praise on someone. Give a gift to someone. Take cash with you and offer a bit to a stranger who seems to be struggling. Engage that person or, and other persons in conversation to see what you can praise and commend in him or her. Because of your faith, because of our faith, let us be creative and expressive with praise and appreciation. Be intentional about naming the best in others. Be cheerful, happy, cheerfully, happily generous. Try it, test it, release your faith, and find the joy. May it be so in the name of the God who creates us, redeems us, and keeps us. Amen. And now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that hope may abound in all of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to the table today, we are reminded that it was on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us that he took bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Holy God, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on us gathered today and on these gifts of bread and wine. 
make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. It is by your spirit that you make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Amen. And now with the confidence of being children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And the cup of salvation, poured out for you. Amen. McFarland, will you enter into this time of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, God, we are just in prayer today in, in so many different places. God, not only physically, but maybe mentally. God, maybe spiritually. God, some of us may be in our living rooms, bedrooms, wherever we may be watching worship today, just struggling idly, silently, feeling somewhat alone on this walk that we are taking with you. But God, I, I pray that wherever we find ourselves in the midst of this season, God, that you just remind us of your closeness. God, that you are never more than just a step away from us, there to catch us when we fall, there to guide us when we are lost, there to comfort us when we are hurting. And God, I pray that you use each and every one of us as instruments in your work. God, that our brothers and sisters in this world that need to know that they are cared for and loved, that need to know that they are worth comforting and, and patience and peace. God, let us be extensions of that grace of yours that reminds them that you are there. And God, whenever we have the opportunity in, in our walk to present you to others, God, help us to always point the, the glory and the praise back to you. Let it never be for our own glorification, God. God, because in everything that we do, let it be an act of worship. Whether we eat, whether we speak, in our, in our, in our car drives, in, in, our, in our Zoom meetings, in our classrooms, whether that be in person or online, God, you are still at work in this world of ours. And, and God, it can be kind of hard sometimes to, to see that given the current circumstance. But God, never let us forget. And God, when we maybe begin to forget, God, when we maybe begin to have a shadow of a doubt, just make it boldly known that you are still in this place, at work, using and calling us, calling your people to continue, to continue on this walk, to continue on to build the kingdom. And God, we just give thanks for your presence in this time. God, we pray all this in the name of your holy and precious Son, Jesus. Amen. One, two, one, two. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better Say 
McFarlane, it was great to worship with you today. I hope that you go forth and you have a great week. Go in peace.